Welcome everyone to the next installment of Beckman Culture webinar series. My name is Dr. Chad Schwartz. I'm an application scientist for Beckman Culture here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm honored to host this next session um, with our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Fagan at the National Institute of Standards and Technology on his presentation over the analytical ultracentrifugation of carbon nanotubes. Dr. Fagan received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Johns Hopkins in 2000. He went on to Carnegie Mellon and did a PhD in Chemical Engineering and received that in 2005. <clears throat> Since 2005, he has done a postdoc and is now a product leader for the Particle Tubes and Colloids Project um, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. A couple things to note uh, during this presentation. We ask all listeners to post presentation-related questions using the functions on the left-hand side of the screen, as there will be a brief question and answer session at the end of the talk. Any unanswered questions during this session will be answered by Dr. Fagan following the talk and post it to the webinar link. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the presenting uh, tech, uh, capabilities to Dr. Fagan. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to uh, discuss some of the work that's been going on in my project uh, here at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And thanks for joining to hear about it. So I'm going to talk to you uh, today about the analytical ultracentrifugation of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, as well as to give some background information that you could be applied uh, to other nanoparticles. Before I get started, um, I just want to make it clear that the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, does not endorse any specific uh, products um, or necessarily methodologies. And so even though I may identify those, that does not uh, imply uh, that NIST is endorsing uh, those materials, products, um, et cetera. Also, before I start, I just want to acknowledge um, that a lot of this work was done uh, in conjunction uh, with colleagues, uh, both in my group and across NIST. Uh, and I'm going to particularly highlight Carlos Silvera Batista here, who was a postdoc in my group and did the second uh, technical, or a lot of the work on the second technical example that I'm going to show towards the end of the presentation. So to give an overview as to what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to give a brief introduction on analytical ultracentrifugation and what the technique is and how it's going to work. I'm going to give pro probably the shortest uh, couple slide overview I can on single wall carbon nanotubes so that the rest of the talk makes sense. Um, and then I'm going to uh, go into the meat of the talk and discuss what exactly is it that we can characterize with the analytical ultracentrifugation technique, what are some of the uh, problems or pitfalls that we might encounter, a little bit of discussion as to how uh, those uh, pitfalls can differ for different nanoparticles. And then I'm going to give two technical examples that uh, we've actually published in my group uh, using the analytical ultracentrifugation measurement technique uh, on single wall carbon nanotubes. And so those, both of those technical uh, notes have been published. The first one uh, in ACS Nano in 2013, and then the hydrodynamics measurements uh, we recently published in Langmuir. So what is an analytical ultracentrifuge? An analytical ultracentrifuge is basically a centrifuge that we can see in while it's spinning. And this is going to allow us uh, to actually observe the sedimentation of the particles as a function of time um, and as a function of our applied force. In my lab, um, we're using the Beckman Coulter uh, XLI uh, analytical ultracentrifuge. So I have detection capabilities either using absorbance uh, methodology or using the interference optics system. Um, 
And the AUC works um, when you observe uh, the sedimentation. Um, so I'm just to step back a second, looking up on the top half, half of the slide here, in the center, there is a picture basically of a top-down view of what the actual experimental cell looks like for the analytical ultracentrifuge. And you fill one side uniformly for these measurements with sample. The other side is your reference. And viewing straight through is what we're going to look at in making our experiments. As we make our experiments, the physical property uh, that we're looking at is the sedimentation rate of the particles uh, in that sample volume. So if we have particles that are all of the same density, but in different sizes, basically what we'll see as we'll spin uh, the centrifuge and observe their concentration is that the larger particles will move faster uh, than the smaller particles. And this difference in their sedimentation rates is what we're going to use uh, to characterize those particles. So to do this, uh, to make a measurement, we're basically going to use our optical access to record the radial absorbance or interference fringe patterns that we get with time from the instrument. We're going to assume, or at least in my work I've assumed, that those, that those signals are going to be directly related to our particle concentrations. And then we're going to fit that data numerically uh, with the LAM equation. This equation, which is shown, uh, the top equation shown here, is essentially a mass balance on a sector-shaped slice in a cylindrical geometry. Um, you'll note that we're ignoring convection here. So this is an important uh, experimental detail. You want to make sure your sample is not going to convect when you spin it up to speed. You just want to have uh, ideal sedimentation for your particles. Uh, if we can assume that our sedimentation rate and our diffusion isn't going to uh, vary with, our par with the particle concentration, so this is, means that we're in the ideal sedimentation limit, like infinite dilution, or essentially uh, similar, then that uh, equation gets simplified uh, into this uh, differential equation on the bottom. And that then can be solved numerically uh, with various software molecules or software uh, programs available. The parameter that we're going to measure, so we're observing what we believe is concentration. The parameter that we want to get out of this is our sedimentation coefficient. So uh, let's see, I'll highlight this on the slide. So the sedimentation coefficient is going to be that term, that little s. That's what we want to measure because we can, uh, in the ideal limit, we can directly relate this value, uh, which is basically the velocity that the particle sediments normalized by the acceleration it takes to make that velocity. So it's non-dimensionalized um, by acceleration. We can relate that value uh, to, par to properties of either our dissolved molecules or our particles, our dispersed particles. Um, for all of my work, I use this for formalism um, for evaluating the sedimentation coefficients that we measure because it is more appropriate, um, I believe, for looking at particles. So we have the sedimentation coefficient is equal to the volume of the particle uh, multiplied by the density difference of the particle to the solvent and, and inversely proportional to the hydrodynamic coefficient uh, of the molecule, which will depend on the shape and size of your particle. So to show you a little bit of what the data looks like, um, we're doing sedimentation velocity experiments in my lab uh, for almost exclusively. And in this case, we fill our, that uh, analytical ultracentrifugation cell uniformly with a column height of liquid that should be ideally at a uniform concentration. And so when you measure this, say, with the absorbance signal, which works there, or the absorbance detector, which works very well for the single wall carbon nanotubes, uh, you will get a plateau in absorbance at a uniform value across the entire width of the cell. 
But as the centrifuge starts to spin, uh, as I'll show uh, first in this animation and then in a movie, that uniform uh, profile starts to shift outwards, in this case because the particles are sedimenting, and that boundary will broaden uh, to a de an extent dependent on your particle polydispersity as well as the diffusion coefficient of the particle, uh, which is coupled to the particle size. So at this point, we're going to, uh, or momentarily, we'll show a movie which is going to show in much greater detail uh, what was just shown in that little animation. Um, we're only going to show one out of every five scans taken, but this is a pretty, pretty typical data set for a singly sorted uh, nanotube population, which you know, you'll hear about more in a couple minutes. Um, and in general, you'll see as in this movie, a steeper boundary indicates that we have a more monodispersed population or less diffusion, in this case both, um, and that a broader boundary indicates you have more di uh, diffusion or a significant polydispersity. So if we could show the movie at this point. Okay, so uh, hopefully in that movie you saw that those concentration profiles um, as a function of time, uh, basically the boundary developed on the left-hand side uh, as, in the, as we had in the animation, and that as we went to longer and longer times be, uh, of observation, the boundary shifted to the right, and that indicated that all our particles sedimented, and it's actually the shape of these, the shape and the motion of these concentration profiles that we can numerically uh, fit to uh, extract those sedimentation coefficients. So in this work, uh, we uniformly uh, extracted our sedimentation coefficients using the numerical software uh, SEDFIT that was developed down at NIH. Um, and it's available uh, through uh, this website link here that's being shown, analyticalultracentrifugation.com. So that was a little bit of basics of the AUC. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the single wall carbon nanotubes, why we care about them, and what we want to measure. So single wall carbon nanotubes are a cylindrical allotrope of carbon, that, but in this case they're single wall, so they only have a single layer thick shell. An easy way to conceptualize these molecules is to imagine rolling up a sheet of chicken wire. You can roll up the sheet of chicken wire and make the hexagons overlap at many different diameters and with many different twists, but still get a continuous cylinder. Depending on how you roll it up, however, you'll get a different diameter of that cylinder, um, as well as a different degree of twist of the hexagonal lattice relative to the long uh, axis of the molecule. Every single one of these different diameters and different uh, twists of the lattice are actually individually, are different chemical species of nanotubes, effectively, and each of them has distinct optical, mechanical, thermal, electrical, and mechanical properties, um, many of which uh, we believe will be highly valuable for multiple applications. Um, but because there's so many of them, it makes it a very complex and difficult evaluation to measure those properties, and that's part of what we're going to do. So there are approximately 300 species of nanotubes, not including uh, left and right-handed enantiomers of many of the species. Um, but in our case, generally, we're only looking at a, a few, and synthetic methods will, will generally only make 30 to 40 in a given batch. So these nanotubes are cylindrical. Um, but they can vary in their aspect ratio. They can be short down to 20 or 30 nanometers or shorter, or they can be very long. They can be uh, hundreds or thousands of nanometers in length, which means that their aspect ratio can vary from down around 10 to uh, well over 1,000. This is important for this talk because although that aspect ratio varies tremendously, um, Chemically, they're still basically the same objects. Um, so we need to find a way to deal with that. Uh, a nice thing 
about the nanotubes with the cylindrical geometry is that it's uniform along the, the entire length of the tube, and it's a crystalline lattice. So we know exactly how many carbon atoms there are per nanometer, and that means that when we look at the nanotubes, regardless of their length, they are going to have a length-independent density, um, which is very important as we get a little farther in. The nanotubes also have very large or very long persistence lengths. So these can vary from the small diameter tubes uh, from a few microns out to well over 100 microns for larger diameter tubes. The stiffness increases with the diameter cubed. Um, that's published in this paper that I've uh, noted here with the little asterisk. Um, and this is basically the length you need to go to make the two ends of the nanotube touch. Um, and so the, those lengths being very long, the nanotubes, especially the larger diameter ones, are essentially rods uh, entirely with very little bending. Smaller diameter ones will look, will have a little more bend to them. The last important thing, um, and what I'm showing on the bottom left-hand photo here, is that the nanotubes um, aren't black, as many of them as many people assume, uh, the nanotubes are, can actually be very highly colored uh, because they each have their own individual optical properties. Um, and since those optical properties vary with the species of nanotubes, each individual nanotube turns out to be a different color. Uh, that's shown uh, in, this, uh, in these photographs on that top-hand row. There are different single species of nanotubes. Um, and in the bottom-hand row, there are different diameter range pairs of uh, semiconducting and metallic nanotubes. The fact that they have these uh, strong optical properties which lead to these colors mean that we can readily detect them um, via absorbance optics. So I'm going to mostly use absorbance optics in this talk. Unfortunately, when you buy nanotubes, uh, they come as mixtures of solid powders. Uh, you don't get those nice pretty solutions when you buy them off the shelf from a company. Uh, so we need to actually do the work of putting them into solution and cleaning them up ourselves. Uh, we disperse our nanotubes via sonication uh, with a dispersant molecule, generally in aqueous solutions. For all the work I'm going to talk about today, uh, the nanotubes were initially dispersed uh, with sodium deoxycholate, which is a, a small molecule surfactant. There's actually a chemical structure uh, on there. It's called a bile salt. There are several different variants, which I'll talk about later in the talk, um, and we sonicate in the presence of this molecule. This molecule will absorb on the surface of the nanotubes, uh, rendering it uh, dispersible into the solution. Uh, this creates a black liquid, uh, which is shown in this intermediate step, which we then centrifuge uh, at a reasonable uh, gravitational speed to remove most large aggregates and a lot of the catalyst uh, and some other garbage. Unfortunately, at this stage, uh, we still have uh, other things that are contaminating our dispersion, not just our nanotubes. Uh, we also have additional complications beyond the fact that all these nanotubes, there, that there's multiple species of nanotubes and multiple enantiomers sometimes of those species. Uh, depending on the synthetic method, some of the nanotubes can also be empty. So if they have a closed ends on both ends, then they will have basically vacuum inside. Um, but if there's any hole in the graphene lattice that makes up the nanotube, they'll fill with water, and you get uh, water-filled nanotubes. Um, we'll also have some degree of bundles, as well as uh, other contaminants stuck to the nanotubes and some non-nanotube carbon. So we're going to get rid of those before we make our real measurements. In my project at NIST over the years, we've investigated, uh, developed, and even discovered uh, multiple different methods for processing uh, these initial dispersions of our nanotubes um, to create uh, dispersions of much more highly resolved populations where we can separate um, them by the length of the tube in the population. We can separate out the individual uh, species, which we also call chiralities of the nanotubes. For some of these, we can extract enantiomers, although that's a, that is still a, a large challenge, although uh, it is impactful for this work. And we can sort by 
different modifications to the structure of the nanotubes, including how defective the tubes are or whether or not there is water in the core of the nanotubes. Now, sorting the nanotubes is extremely uh, helpful for characterizing them in the analytical ultracentrifuge uh, and is one of the hallmarks of what I'm going to show uh, because, well, for multiple reasons. Um, for one, it really helps resolve uh, the signal of the features that you're trying to look at. Um, it enables measurements on, on things that you specifically know what they are. Uh, we can look at these samples at various stages of the, pro of the processing to find out how exactly our processing is affecting the nanotubes. Um, and when we're done, basically we know exactly what it is we're measuring, so our results are going to have more value. An example of one of the key things, however, is shown in the, the two figures here. The top figure it shows the absorbance spectra of the as-sonicated and centrifuged parent dispersion of the nanotube with that's a mixture. Uh, and the peaks here reflect the absorbance by different optical transitions of the nanotubes. Because there's multiple different nanotubes in there and there's a lot of gunk, these peak transitions are relatively broad and there's many of them. In the bottom absorbance trace, uh, you'll notice that the peaks now are much, much stronger relative to nonspecific baseline absorbance and we have many fewer of them. Uh, this allows us, this is because we've sorted the sample for only the 6,5 nanotubes, so this highlights a specific structure of nanotube uh, with this unique optical property and allows us to make these measurements at much higher resolution and at much lower concentration of the nanotubes. So that was the basic background for nanotubes. What it is that we can measure? Um, In the most basic sense, with, a, with the analytical ultracentrifugation, we want to measure the distribution of sedimentation coefficients uh, within the population that we're measuring. Um, for the nanotubes, there are a lot of things that are going to be uh, you know, called into this. Um, but if we think at a very basic level, uh, we could really use this sort of measurement for quality control. Um, does a preparation method lead to dispersion that has consistent results? Does that distribution look monomodal, bimodal? Is it really broad? Um, we could use this even without analysis to compare uh, preparations as a function of time. Um, but if we measure other things, we can get a lot more detailed information. Uh, one of the methods I'm going to talk about a lot is to measure the particle density, uh, particularly of our nanotubes. And we're going to do this by changing the background solution density um, such that the difference between the particle density and the solution density changes, which should be directly reflected in the sedimentation coefficients. And if you measure this at multiple densities, you can basically eliminate um, all the unknowns that you don't know uh, about your particle. All the hydrodynamics come out, the volume of the particles fall out, uh, and you can solve for your particle density, and that will tell us a lot about our particle. But if you can get even a little more information, if you know your particle density uh, and your other solution parameters, you can then look at the, pop the sedimentation coefficient distributions you measure and say, uh, well, what shape particle would give me this distribution? And if you know how your uh, hydrodynamics change with your particle size or shape, you can eventually extract uh, particle size distributions. One of the things that we really want to measure, particularly for the nanotubes, is the environment uh, on the nanotube surface. So the environment surrounding a nanoparticle in general, but the single wall carbon nanotubes in particular, critically affects uh, the properties of the nanotube. Um, it affects how it interacts with its environment. It affects its optical properties. It affects uh, its transport properties. It affects how, um, in applications, uh, it's going to interact with, say, an environment in, um, in, in vivo. So say you're going to wrap this with a protein to target it for uptake by a specific cell. Uh, if it absorbs new things to its surface other than that protein, it's not 
it may not go where you want. Uh, so we really would like to know what is on the surface of the nanotube so that we can do better design and engineering. I, I'm just going to show a quick example here that I'll come back to and revisit later in the talk on how uh, the environment and what you put on the surface of the nanotube, uh, change, how that changes the properties of the nanotube, um, very simply. And one property uh, that, nano, that specific semiconducting single wall carbon nanotubes have is that they will fluoresce in near infrared. However, the intensity of this fluorescence is extremely dependent on the degree to which the interfacial layer on the nanotube surface uh, screens the nanotube from the broader environment. Uh, on this slide, what I'm showing is data that I've taken on a dispersion of nanotubes that I dispersed with single-stranded DNA and then exchanged that, surfac that dispersant layer with a small molecule bile salt dis uh, dispersant including the sodium deoxycholate I talked about earlier, but also two other uh, single point mutation variants of the, of the sodium deoxycholate, sodium cholate and sodium torodeoxycholate. Every, all three of these uh, different variants will displace the DNA from the tube surface and create a different local environment around the tube. And this leads to the nanotubes exhibiting uh, dramatically different uh, uh, yields of fluorescence for the same uh, excitation. And in fact, the, if you wrap the tube with sodium deoxycholate at 1% of the surfactant, you get almost twice the fluorescence out that you get from the sodium cholate wrapped tubes uh, at the same concentration. So it's just a simple example uh, of how the effect of what's on the surface and knowing exactly what's on the surface uh, is important for uh, driving or determining or engineering the properties that we want from our nanotubes. So if we want to think about uh, what's on the surface of the nanotubes, we should think about what the, the geometry actually is. Um, so if I were to draw a picture of the nanotube in a layer cake model uh, looking down the long axis of the tube, um, you would get this figure. So on this figure in the very center, we're looking straight down the long axis of the nanotube. And then around that nanotube, you would pack a layer of surfactants that would be distributed in space, but mostly centered around the nanotube, presumably. And then attached in with that or around it will be water molecules that are hydrating that surfactant. Uh, out to some radius. And those are the two, two of the things that we really want to, to measure. I'm going to highlight them here on this figure uh, with some shaded lines to make it much more easy to see. Um, so I'm going to use a layer cake concept uh, for how surfactants might or other molecules might pack on the tube surface. Um, to describe this, the interior of the nanotube here is in blue. So this, allow, this is whether or not this is water filled. The brown uh, ring here is effectively the nanotube, which we know exactly its crystalline structure and density of. The red circle is going to be the minimum volume of surfactant packed on the outside of the, the tube that we're going to measure. And there's going to be some amount of water, which needs some amount of volume which leads to this larger outer radius, which is the blue dashed line. So our job now, uh, what we're going to do and what we've been interested in is to measure our nanotubes in solution uh, with the AUC, use uh, density contrast measurements to extract uh, information about the density, and then we want to find out exactly how thick are these layers and how different are they between different molecules. Lastly, though, before I get into that, um, there are a couple of things you want to consider before you jump right in and make some measurements. So for, for many uh, nanoparticles, you have extended aspect ratios, um, very different from uh, dissolved uh, molecules that uh, 
huddle up and have relatively small radiuses of uh, gyration, uh, the concentration effects in terms of packing and when you go out of the limits of ideal sedimentation depend on the particle shape. For uh, single wall carbon nanotubes, there are rods, and so the amount of volume that they effectively fill goes up with the radius squared. Um, so even very low concentrations of the nanotubes, you can run out of the ideal sedimentation range. But other anisotropic particles that are nanoparticles uh, will also fall into this category. Uh, and so you always want to be careful that you work at low concentrations um, where you're not going to run into uh, concentration effects. Another thing you're going to want to know before you start, um, or as we're going, you'll see you want to know what your effective particle is. Um, you'll see very shortly that you need to worry about it. Depending on what your particle is, um, as we do the experiment, you might need to worry about uh, things like hydrogen and deuterium exchange due to pH and PD differences, uh, and whether or not you're putting in buffers where you'll have salts uh, molecules, say, that are excluded from your hydration layer. Another thing that's very critical uh, is knowing what your solution densities and viscosities are going to be. Um, these are, are generally available in tabulated form for many biological molecules. Uh, but as in our case, um, when we're measuring surfactant solutions or surfactant solutions at different concentrations or at different uh, background liquids, uh, we really, you really have to measure those values explicitly on the solutions that you're going to work with uh, because those values will directly impact the accuracy of your results. Uh, a last thing is uh, generally absorbance is going to report uh, absorbance in particular is going to uh, report a mass average uh, sedimentation coefficient distribution. And so comparing that to other techniques, uh, such as ASM, where you're counting, actually counting particles and going to measure a number average, uh, that's an important thing to consider. Or light scattering, where you uh, may measure another different uh, sort of particle size average, something you want to think about before your measurements start. So on to the actual work, <laughs> now that I've spent uh, 20 minutes here you know, running you through the basics. Um, now we're going to actually measure our nanotubes. And I'm going to start off by telling you about the density contrast measurements to measure the interfacial layers around the surface of what, in this case, uh, is a sample of nanotubes enriched in a single species. Uh, this is going to be the 6 comma 5 species. It's a relatively small diameter nanotube. Its diameter is under a nanometer um, by the carbon center to carbon center's definition, or just slightly over a nanometer when you uh, uh, add in the, the volume exclusion of that, uh, that carbon shell. Um, the sample we're going to look at has, not, has been sorted both by only be a single species, but also to be a very uh, a sort of narrow uh, length distribution. Uh, and both these things are going to make our data much clearer. So here, uh, again, is an optical trace. I showed this earlier, but just to point out, this is the actual uh, absorbance spectra of the sample that we're going to measure in the analytical ultracentrifuge, as well as a picture of, of the sample before dilution to our working conditions uh, in a one millimeter cuvette, showing off the color that these optical transitions uh, give uh, to the nanotube solution, uh, as well as well a, an AFM there that uh, basically demonstrates that the nanotubes are all approximately uh, about a micron in length. So looking at this uh, spectra, we're going to measure the sedimentation of the nanotubes at, uh, we can measure it at various different wavelengths. For this work, we primarily measured the concentration, or measure the absorbance in the analytical ultracentrifuge at the two wavelengths specified by the arrows. Uh, we didn't find any difference regardless of which wavelength we used to measure the, the concentration. But these two specific wavelengths uh, give us the, uh, the strongest absorbance uh, at a given concentration um, 
of the nanotubes. And so it both increases our signal to noise strength as well as allowing us to work at uh, uh, the lowest concentrations that we can so that we have to worry the least about um, concentration effects and not being in the non-ideal range. So let's look at some actual data uh, that, we actually, that we measured on the analytical ultracentrifuge. So at the top of here on this page um, are a series of concentration profiles that I measured on that 6,5 nanotube sample from the last slide in a 10 gram per liter sodium deoxycholate surfactant solution uh, in water at 20 degrees uh, Celsius. We're only showing every third scan here, um, but we, we took a lot more uh, data because, well, why not? Uh, it certainly allows you to fit um, at very high resolution. So if you look at these concentration scans, the first one, which starts at the very left, uh, basically gives you a flat plateau all the way across. That's because we uniformly filled the solution into the cell before spinning it. And then as the uh, centrifuge is spinning, the nanotubes are sedimenting. So the concentration boundary develops on the left-hand side there and then slowly moves rightward uh, with time. Uh, even before we fit this data, uh, it's clear from these uh, concentration curves that we have a relatively monodispersed sample. The boundary that you see is steep um, and apparently singular. We don't see any evidence of multiple rates of sedimentation. Um, and the, we see a nice uh, generally uh, uniformly decaying absorbance region in the uh, absorbance signal in the plateau region. Uh, which is due to radial dilution, um, and meaning that we don't see much or any back diffusion uh, either. So we have these concentration profiles, and as I said before, we're going to use this, uh, numerical, the software SEDFIT to numerically uh, fit the distribution of sedimentation coefficients uh, that best describes this data. And now I'm going to, up it should come. Here we go. Uh, show the fit lines that said fit gives um, uh, in terms of the concentration profiles that said fit uh, calculates on top of the actual measured experimental data. And here is the distribution of sedimentation coefficients that reflects uh, those fit lines in the curve. So we have an extremely uh, sharp distribution, it's monomodal, um, and that's good because it's going to help us resolve our, the effects on our nanotubes as we uh, make changes to our background solution density. So that's our data. Again, what do we want to measure? Uh, we want to measure the density and sizes of the various layers surrounding the nanotubes. The first of which we're going to get at by using a density contrast between uh, water and deuterium oxide. So we're going to go from H2O to D2O as our background liquid, but we're going to keep our uh, 10 gram per liter sodium deoxycholate solution constant, uh, concentration constant the entire time. Um, and as long as the D2O distributes uniformly throughout the entire volume of the fluid, including the hydration layer surrounding the nanotube, what it is that we're going to measure in terms of the density of our particle is going to be what is called the anhydrous partial specific volume. So this is going to be uh, the density of the nanotube plus its surfactant without any contribution uh, from the background water. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, the measurements of uh, anhydrous partial specific volumes via density contrast. There's an excellent paper uh, by Brown et al. in PLOS One uh, in 2011 um, that you can go and look at. So we want to measure here, let's pull this up. We want to get at the density of the particle by changing this, uh, the density of our background media. We're going to do this by water to D2O, and this is again should be directly proportional to our sedimentation coefficients. So now on this slide I'm showing the measured distributions of sedimentation coefficients for the same 6-5 sample 
only changing the ratio of water to D2O uh, in the uh, sample solution, or, uh, keeping everything else constant. What the data shows is that as we add more D2O, the average sedimentation coefficient is becoming monotonically smaller. So uh, in this, i.e., the nanotubes are sedimenting more slowly. And so on the figure, uh, the peak is moving leftwards. Um, now, part of this is solution viscosity changes, which you have to take into account. And we're going to take those into account on all the, on the future slides that we show, because uh, the, the viscosity of water in D2O is, is different. Um, but if we assume that the peak of these sedimentation coefficient distributions is representative of the same mode of the particle distribution at every solution condition, uh, we're going to be able to extrapolate out to when this mode of the distribution would go all the way down to zero with our, by changing the background density of the liquid. And that will be, you would get to zero when the density of the particle matches the density of that background liquid. Before I do that, though, I just want to point out um, that doing separations and having as monodispersed of a population as possible really enables you uh, to uh, improve the precision of the measurements that you're going to do. Um, so on this slide, I'm comparing the distributions that I showed on the back or on the on the past slide. Uh, first is distributions that were measured uh, for the same water to D2O uh, comparison for other nanotube public for other nanotube populations that were either only sorted by species, which is the top figure, or just as prepared, which is the bottom figure. Now, I don't want to be negative about this data. Both these papers were published uh, a long time before I did uh, my work, and they were really the impetus for uh, us doing these measurements at all. Um, but moving forward, I think it's clear that the more uh, you know about your population and the more resolved it is, it's, uh, the more powerful AUC will be as a tool for enhancing, uh, for measuring these and characterizing these populations. So now we're going to plot only uh, the different modes of that distribution, so what the S values were uh, that we measured um, as a function of the background solution density, uh, correcting the sedimentation coefficient for the viscosity of the, uh, of the different solutions. So this is giving us, uh, so if we plot those peaks out for different solutions, here varying from uh, the, the sedimentation velocity in just water uh, to the sedimentation velocity uh, in D2O, and then moving towards, we actually want to make measurements in D2A18O because the nanotubes are, are relatively dense, and we wanted points out here closer to the intercept to improve our precision. Um, you can see uh, that, as expected, the difference in the density of that, that density difference between the particle and the medium is directly proportional and you know, linearly proportional uh, to the sedimentation coefficient value. Um, and if we fit a line through all these points, um, which the points are basically identical regardless of how we define the mode of that distribution, we can, we can measure an intercept, uh, which is where the sedimentation coefficient would go to zero. And that gives us the density of this specific nanotube species in this specific solution condition. Um, in this case, it's 1,574 plus or minus 20 kilograms uh, per meter cubed, um, which is the anhydrous density of our nanotube, uh, this specific nanotube. However, if there are any uh, nanotube separation folks listening, um, you'll realize that this density uh, is very different from the density that we often think about um, when we centrifuge nanotubes, which is the density of the nanotubes that we observe during densi density gradient ultracentrifugation, which is a separation technique uh, where we're trying to separate out different species of nanotubes based on their density differences 
due to their ge uh, geometric differences. The reason why we measure uh, have a different density here in this measurement um, is that the water and the D2O are uniformly exchanged uh, throughout the entire uh, volume of the solution, including the hydration volume. And that makes the hydration volume uh, effectively have the same, back, the same density as the background solution, which makes it invisible to the density measurement. So in this case, we're only measuring the density of the nanotube plus its, its attached surfactant. So what does this anhydrous density tell us? Um, in the case of sodium deoxycholate, we can independently measure what the density is of our uh, surfactant molecule. We do this uh, using a crack key balance technique. Um, and we know exactly what the density is of our crystalline uh, constant diameter uh, carbon shell lattice if we assume then that the water inside the nanotube, because uh, these are water-filled nanotubes, is reflective of the outside uh, solution conditions, we can then just do a, a mass balance and calculate out what the minimum volume of surfactant uh, is required to be attached to the nanotube to get the density that we measure. If we use our layer cake model, we get the ge these uh, geometric sizes on the left-hand uh, side figure here. Um, which I'm going to circle, um, where our nanotube core is just a little over a nanometer across and it's excluded volume. Uh, and then we have then another sort of nanometer of closely packed assumed surfactant uh, on the surface. Now this is a minimal radius of the absorbed surfactant um, because our density measurement isn't telling us anything about how the surfactant is spatially distributed around the nanotube as long as it's spatially the same in all of the solution conditions in which we measured it. Uh, it could actually all be out stuck on a straight line from the nanotube surface, but this seems unlikely. Uh, it seems much more likely that it would sort of be radially uniform, in which case the calculation uh, based on the size of the sodium deoxycholate molecule tells us that we would have roughly 93% uh, surface coverage um, of the nanotube surface by deoxycholate uh, with four and a half or approximately uh, molecules of that surfactant per linear nanotube or linear nanometer down the axis of the, uh, the nanotube. Um, both these values turn out to be uh, a little large for a single layer coverage. Um, and so it's uh, because the calculation of that coverage percent doesn't uh, include uh, steric hindrance between the surfactants themselves. So we probably have more than a single layer structure uh, attached here. So that's what we can tell from the anhydrous measurement uh, when measuring water versus D2O. And now I mentioned the term effective particle several times earlier. And what I mean by this is, uh, well, Suppose instead of adding uh, D2O instead of water, I was going to vary the density of our background solution by adding a molecule that was excluded from the hydration layer around the nanotube. In this case, the bulk solution now has a density difference to the hydration layer as well as to the uh, surfactant and the nanotube itself. So now our effective particle, instead of just being the nanotube plus the surfactant, is the nanotube plus the surfactant plus all of the water in the region from which the uh, density modifying agent uh, is excluded on average. Um, so this is going to incorporate or integrate into the density that we're going to measure all of this uh, volume of water uh, along with our uh, surfactant and nanotube density. So let's make this measurement. Uh, we're going to use the mo a molecule iodixinol, which is what we what is used for nanotube separations frequently uh, as our excluded um, density contrast modifying molecule. On this slide, I'm now showing the same data points I did before in the dark blue line, uh, but also adding the measurements that we make uh, 
when, or the results of the measurements when we add this excluded molecule uh, to make the density contrast. And as you'll see, the intercept here is at a dramatically lower density than previously. Um, and that's because we've integrated in all of that water to calculating the, to, in the effective particle to make uh, uh, the density measurement. So what does this value tell us? Uh, this uh, value tells us that if the density of the water in the hydration layer is the same as that of the bulk surfactant solution, then the hydrated radius has to extend quite a long way from the nanotube surface um, and well beyond where the minimum anhydrous radius is. Um, this is going to be another point of comparison for what's on the surface of the nanotube. Um, and again, as the single layer, uh, or as the more than one layer uh, sort of um, shell that we were uh, thinking about from the anhydrous measurement, this measurement of the amount of water that has to be attached to the nanotube to reduce its density by that much um, has to be mathematically quite a bit. Um, and this is also consistent with having more than a single layer of nanotube uh, packing. So let's revisit sort of looking at the differences uh, in the surfactant packing layers as a function of those uh, different uh, bile salt surfactant structures that I mentioned earlier. So earlier, I replaced single-stranded DNA with one of three different uh, small molecule bile salts and measured that there were different fluorescences. In this case, instead, I'm going, I, I, what we experimentally did was dialyzed the uh, nanotubes from one bile salt surfactant to another bile salt surfactant um, over very long periods of time to make sure we had full and complete exchange and then measured the fluorescence of each of those uh, resulting samples. So after dialysis, the absorbance spectra of all of our nanotube samples are exactly the same, or within very small shifts regarding to differences in the dielectric environment. And the peaks of the fluorescence are only going to shift slightly. But what we find is that the fluorescence intensity still changes dramatically depending upon what our dispersant molecule is. Uh, in this case, um, again, we're looking at this fluorescence. And what we find here is that our deoxychloe and our torodeoxychloe display uh, sam dispersed samples, uh, display effectively identical intensities of fluorescence, whereas the sodium cholate dispersed sample displays much less fluorescence. And we know that this is exactly the same sample and exactly the same solutions. Um, and so we want to re relate this property change to that surfactant packing. So let's go and measure how those packings are different on the various surfactants by redoing our density contrast measurements, both for the anhydrous value and for the hydrated value. OK. So here is the plot showing the viscosity corrected mode sedimentation coefficient values versus solution density for each of the three bile salt surfactants, all in the same population of nanotube. Um, you'll see immediately that there's clear differences um, between each of the populations in where their intercepts are, as well as in the absolute values of their sedimentation. Um, the deoxycholate is these black circles. And so both the sodium cholate and the sodium torodeoxycholate uh, samples um, are obviously, uh, are both have higher uh, sedimentation coefficients, so they sediment faster. Uh, but this is interesting because both of their densities at the intercepts are lesser. Um, so their density difference is lower. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. Their densities that are actually lower um, in terms of the anhydrous density is interesting. And their density of their hydrated density is higher. Um, so those are the three things that you can pull out. And these are related exactly to the differences in structure of the bound surfactant layers on, on the nanotubes. So we can independently measure uh, the density of the surfactant molecules. Um, 
and then simply calculate out what the anhydrous shell size has to be, as well as the hydrated shell size has to be for each of the three surfactants. Uh, I'm going to skip to another sli the next slide here where those values have been tabulated out. But I think the more interesting uh, part of this slide is comparing the actual physical sizes of what those minimum uh, anhydrous surfactant packing layer size has to be, as well as the, what the size of the hydrated layer has to be uh, based on that, just uh, based mathematically on the density differences. Um, on the upper part here, uh, the uh, density is telling us that there uh, is more surfactant in both cases for the sodium cholate and the sodium taurodeoxycholate in terms of shell size, on, in terms of volume of surfactant stuck onto the nanotube surface, um, but particularly in the sodium cholate case, the hydrated shell size uh, is dramatically smaller um, than for the other two surfactants. Um, this is going to a smaller hydrated shell size. We can thus hypothesize uh, is going to allow more penetration of the environment around the nanotube down to the nanotube surface and lower the observed fluorescence that we saw uh, two slides ago. The, uh, the taurodeoxycholate, in contrast, um, probably it's a different shaped molecule. It probably is packing in a single layer, uh, which accounts for the densities that we measured uh, on and reported tabulatedly, um, whereas the deoxycholate uh, forms a double layer. Now, so from our density contrast measurements, we can then say our deoxycholate molecule is forming roughly a one to two layer uh, solution shell around our nanotube, uh, whereas sodium cholate or sodium taurate deoxycholate form basically a single layer around the nanotube, um, just with different packing densities and with different uh, exclusion of water from the nanotube surface. And these results are consistent with what people have inferred from various other measurement techniques, but we now know with um, dramatically higher precision um, than those other techniques reported and can make the direct correlation to our fluorescence or our other optical properties that change as a function of those molecules. So that work was all published in that first paper that I mentioned in ACS Nano, basically uh, looking at making these density contrast measurements on the nanotubes uh, and walking before we started running and looking at more difficult problems. I'm going to uh, relatively quickly now go through the second example uh, that we uh, did or that we published out of my project here on looking at the hydrodynamics of the single wall carbon nanotubes in solution. And this is some uh, what I think is beautiful work done by Carlos Silvera Batista when he was here at NIST. So instead of using that 6-5 uh, nanotube sample we used earlier, here uh, Carlos used empty uh, single wall carbon nanotubes of somewhat larger diameter uh, that he first separated out uh, to isolate only these empty tubes. Um, and then he took that population and he length fractionated it using a high resolution technique called size exclusion chromatography to generate multiple length populations of the nanotubes, but with uh, a uniform diameter distribution of the nanotubes in all populations, but different lengths of the nanotubes across the populations. Um, to be able to measure hydrodynamics, you need to know what the size distribution is of your particles. So for comparison to the results we're going to get off of AUC, uh, Carlos went and measured thousands of nanotubes, or at least hundreds of nanotubes, um, for each of these individual length fractions with uh, atomic force microscopy, or ASM, to be able to, count, to, be able to measure the length distributions of those particles uh, or of the different populations uh, accurately. 
Uh, these distributions are shown here on the upper right. Um, and you'll note that the, uh, the scale on the x-axis changes a little bit. Uh, so we have dramatically different length populations of our nanotubes. Now we want to measure the hydrodynamics of the nanotubes. Uh, as I mentioned way back at the beginning of the talk, uh, the sediment, we're going to get at these through the sedimentation coefficient. The sedimentation coefficient is proportional to the volume of the particle and proportional to the density difference, which we use in our density contrast studies, and inversely proportional to our hydrodynamics. So we want to look at the hydrodynamics. Um, but before we can do that, we need to know what the density of our particles are, so we make sure that we don't uh, bring in any effect of that. And we want to know both the particle density and what the hydration radius is um, for our comparison point. But as we spent, I spent a couple minutes going over, uh, we know exactly how to do this. I mean, we measure our particle density through our density contrast variation. Um, and for these particular uh, diameter nanotubes, for the empty nanotubes, uh, we can measure now our anhydrous density, which is the red line through the red points with an intercept of uh, 1317 kilograms per meter cubed as its anhydrous density, uh, and 1060 uh, kilograms per meter cubed as its hydrated density. Um, You'll notice that the anhydrous density is quite a bit lower here. That's because the, uh, the empty core of the nanotube is basically acting like a balloon, a density difference to the water, uh, which vastly reduces its density. Um, and from the density difference between those two density measurements, we can calculate out that our hydrated diameter is approximately uh, 7 nanometers. This is, a, this is an important value to measure because it's quite likely that if the hydration layer is, is fairly smooth, then the radius at which the shear plane is um, hydrodynamically for the nanotube is likely to be pretty close to uh, this value of the hydrated diameter. Um, so it's going to give us a comparison point when we look at hydrodynamic models uh, to compare against. And if a hydrodynamic model basically predicts a hydrodynamic, a radial hydrodynamic radius less than the three and a half nanometers indicated by this hydration radius. Uh, we can pretty much say it's not well representing our data because it's not physically uh, possible. So what are the sort of models that people have used for friction coefficients of extended rod structures such as single wall carbon nanotubes? Uh, and basically, there are several different sets. Uh, we chose to compare the effectiveness um, of different models, including a low-order asymptotic expansion expression, uh, uh, the Brerisma expression that's commonly used uh, in the literature, a higher-order asymptotic expansion expression. This expression is from Batchelor, um, and an exact numerical method calculated expression uh, that was recently done using the path integration method Zeno. Um, Although the details of each of these uh, hydrodynamic expressions differ, uh, all three of them are to first order stating that longer nanotubes will, will sediment logarithmically faster uh, with respect to their aspect ratio than shorter nanotubes. Um, so the general trend is all the same. Can we tell the difference apart between the details? So I showed you uh, the data of measuring the, the background uh, density difference. Let's look at the sedimentation coefficients distributions that we measure with the length, uh, with the different length fractions of the nanotubes. So on the far right-hand side of these distributions of sedimentation coefficients that are shown in the figure is the sedimentation of the longest population that we measure. So we see exactly the trend that we expect, where the longest tubes sediment the fastest. The, uh, so this is the A4. The, and the shorter populations sediment uh, monotonically less fast than those longest uh, populations. 
Now the top data here uh, shows the sedimentation coefficient distributions um, that we measured uh, directly as we measured them and calculated their values for via SEDFIT. Um, unfortunately, our separation of the empty and the water-filled nanotubes was not 100% efficient. Um, and so these structures are bimodal. Uh, and so we deconvoluted the contributions of the, of the empty and the water-filled tubes, which both have the same length distribution uh, from each other, so that we only look at the sedimentation coefficient distributions of the empty tubes. And that's this deconvoluted data is shown on this lower figure, uh, the details of which you can look up uh, uh, in the actual paper. So what should we see if we plot the sedimentation coefficient uh, mode of these distributions versus the mass average length uh, that we can calculate from our AFM data? Um, so I said that all of the hydrodynamic theories say that we should see logarithmically faster sedimentation uh, as a function of the length of the rod or as a function of the aspect ratio, which for a constant diameter rod uh, is essentially with the length of the rod. Um, so we expect to see this red line curve, uh, which is a logarithmic curve. Um, and if I plot the data out on the figure, this is exactly what we see. Um, we looked at two different diameter distributions of empty nanotubes uh, as a function of their length and found, find that their sedimentation coefficient distributions do uh, well reflect this, uh, this logarithmic trend in their sedimentation velocity uh, as a function of their aspect ratio. Um, to be a little more complex in our analysis, we can, do, we can use our hydrodynamic models and calculate out what the best fit hydrodynamic radius is using that, uh, using each of those models to represent our experimental data. This is tabulated below. Um, and if we make this comparison between our radial hydrodynamic radius, so this is the, the radius radially from the nanotube surface where that slip plane is, uh, versus our mass balance uh, determined hydra uh, hydrated radius, uh, we, what we find is that the higher order asymptotic expansion expression, as well as two different numerical models, uh, the Mansfield-Douglas exact solution and a second uh, numerical model solution, uh, all give values for this radial hydrodynamic radius extremely uh, consistent with the mass balance calculated hydrated radius um, from the density contrast measurements, but that the simple, uh, the uh, low order asymptotic expansion expression doesn't, nor does a leading term expansion expression. Both of those give uh, values for what you would expect the hydrodynamic radius to be that are uh, aphysical with the hydrated radius that we independently calculated, it means that over the range of aspect ratios that we're looking at, those expressions uh, do not uh, well describe the hydrodynamics of our single wall carbon nanotubes. Um, I like to point that out because frequently in the literature, people use these uh, either leading term expansion expressions or the low order asymptotic expansion uh, expression because the expressions are so simple. Um, but basically, you're using something that is going to be adding, uh, that is physically not going to well describe in the sedimentation of those single wall carbon nanotubes. But if we look at the higher order ones, uh, it works out extremely well. And the exact equations almost exactly give the same, I mean, well within the error bars, um, give almost identical, uh, even nominal values for what the, uh, that hydrated and hydration radius are. Um, so as I like to say, you know, 90 plus years of hydrodynamic theory actually works. Um, and this is actually a great accomplishment. Uh, I want to you know, say I was um, extremely uh, uh, proud of the work that Carlos did on this. Um, this is the first demonstration that 
uh, the hydrodynamic theory for a rod works over an aspect ratio range anywhere near this. Um, previously, it had been done with several uh, uh, monomodal particles, such as TMV, or uh, very short aspect ratio rods, like gold nanorod sort of things, or silicon nanorods, but that could only get up to aspect ratio of about 20, um, or such as the TMV, or discrete particles, or F FD virus. Um, here we have the identically the identical chemical species of nanotubes, um, but have an aspect ratio variation from about uh, 40 to several hundred for the same particle, and we verified that the hydrodynamics worked. Um, so that's really nice to know. Uh, but this is only the mode of the distribution. How does this comparison uh, of the hydrodynamics look if we actually look at the entire distribution shape? So we've independently measured the distribution of the lengths via that counting technique, atomic force microscopy, uh, and we have our sedimentation coefficient distributions. So let's look at the uh, distribution of lengths you would calculate using the different hydrodynamic models uh, from the sedimentation coefficients and compare them to our AFM data. So if we look only at one fraction, it's a, this is a fraction of uh, length that's right in the middle of our our distribution that we're looking at. So this was, these are nanotubes that are effectively 250 nanometers long. Uh, we find that the distribution of lengths, which is the solid line calculated using a hydrodynamic model from our sedimentation coefficient data, only well represent, only well matches with our AFM counting data. Uh, again, for the more complex expressions, here with the Bachelor expression or the Mansfield, uh, Mansfield Douglas expression, you can see that for both of the two diameter populations shown, that the solid line is well matched up with the histogram, which is the as measured data from the AFM data. But those low order expressions uh, fail horribly uh, in accurately representing the data. So if we have particles that we know uh, the density of, and we know which hydrodynamic model works, let's check now that we can reproduce our length distribution across the entire range of length distributions that we're interested in. So now I'm going to use the Mansfield-Douglas expression, use the sedimentation coefficient distributions from every single one of those fractions of different lengths that we measured, and compare them to our AFM data. And what we find is that the AUC does a tremendously good job of measuring uh, sedimentation coefficient distributions that can be uh, converted into length distributions of the nanotubes using the validated hydrodynamic model, um, and that nearly identically overlap with our AFM-derived histograms for each of the various length fractions uh, changing by more, by almost an order of magnitude uh, in their average length. Um, so this was really, I think, a tremendous result, and it's the sort of result that's going to allow us in the future um, to use the analytical ultra centrifuge for uh, high precision quality control measurements um, and characterization. So that concludes my talk about that. Uh, technical aspect, and I'll just wrap up quickly because I know I'm over time. Um, you know, in, in summary, uh, I hope I've shown that AUC is a viable and powerful method for characterizing single wall carbon nanotubes in particular, but I think other nanoparticles in general. Uh, the more monodisperse your sample is, the better your measurements will be in terms of their precision, um, but you can always do quality control, I believe. Uh, understanding your effective particle is necessary. Um, you know, if you're going to put your particles in and try to measure them, you want to know what your environment is doing uh, in terms of what your effective particle will be to an analyze your result. Um, and this is really at the cutting edge of nanoscience. So with that, um, I think I'll skip this where we're, we're going uh, slide. Uh, maybe not. We have better separations. We're going to more advanced experiments to look at smaller differences through the AUC. 
And we'll use these densities that we measure to provide a basis uh, to fundamentally uh, do comparisons with molecular simulation studies. I hope that you'll follow along with this, these results uh, as we complete them and are published. Um, and so I want to thank uh, the organizers of this webinar for, again, for, allow, for giving me the opportunity to tell you about my work. And again, my colleagues, uh, many who are all been wonderful colleagues uh, and did a lot of the action, a lot of this work, and I want to acknowledge their contributions. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your time, and I'll take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Fagan. Very interesting talk. It's fantastic that the analytical ultra centrifuge can validate not only 90 years worth of work, but also uh, other complementary technologies such as AFM. At this time, I would like to point everybody to the blue Q&A um, uh, button on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, we're still taking questions um, for Dr. Fagan to answer. Um, in the meantime, there were a couple that came in already. Um, one question asked, if concentration has such an important effect on carbon nanotube sedimentation and behavior, wouldn't the concentration become a problem as the carbon nanotubes are packed closer during the centrifugation process? Um, I think this is related to um, aggregation of carbon nanotubes as they are centrifuging. Can you provide some insights, Dr. Fagan? Uh, yes, yeah, so that, I mean, that's, that's a good question. Um, in a large extent, uh, these, the nanotubes that we're looking at are, are large uh, compared to what you would maybe a biological molecule that many people are, are familiar with for the technique. And that makes um, their diffusion basically meaningless relative to their ballistic sedimentation from the, uh, the applied uh, acceleration. This means that there's really no back diffusion off of the bottom boundary of the cell. Uh, and so there's no increase in concentration that penetrates back into the volume that we're measuring uh, from that back diffusion. So actually, uh, we start the uniform concentration at the beginning is the highest concentration that the nanotubes experience during the entire experiment because as they sediment, they're moving, um, in these experiments, they're sedimenting, they're moving towards the bottom, and the, shell, the cell is sector-shaped, so it is expanding um, with the radius uh, at, along, uh, as you move out from the center of rotation. And so the nanotubes are actually uh, undergoing radial dilution as they move outwards, because that sector uh, the slice of volume is increasing um, uh, as you go farther in radius from the center of rotation. So as long as the concentration at the beginning is not a problem, um, it's not a con it's not a pro it doesn't develop to be a problem at least with nanotubes over maybe 30 or 40 nanometers where they are effectively become non-diffusive. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, no other questions have came in, so I'll ask one myself. Um, what is your separation range? Uh, are you able to resolve um, carbon nanotubes on the angstrom level using the AUC? Uh, in terms of their diameter, uh, yes. Uh, the, the density differences that we're measuring um, and that we, uh, in the AUC, and that we exploit uh, in a preparative centrifuge by putting a density gradient medium in that uh, allows you to spatially resolve uh, those different buoyant density nanotubes based on their structures. Uh, the different nanotube structures can be effectively down to like 0 0.01 angstroms in difference from each other. So on the, in terms of diameter, Yes, you can resolve uh, those differences in density. Um, we haven't yet done that. That's probably uh, the limits of the precision uh, 
of the instrument the way we've been doing the experiment are probably not quite that high uh, in the characterization side yet, but are close. Uh, in terms of length, uh, I think, you know, we still, uh, I, it's just, the fitting is, I think, very impressive. Um, but certainly, uh, we're not getting down to angstrom resolution. Um, I, I think that the, the nanometer, uh, tens of nanometers scale in comparison, you know, if we're down at, I, we're probably at about a 15% uh, error bar on those averages, um, but in the, our populations are varying by a factor of uh, 10 to 100 in length, so a factor of 15% uh, off the average is still, I would say, very uh, good. Great, thank you. A very powerful uh, technique. With that, I'd like to conclude the Beckman Culture webinar series and again thank our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Fagan, uh, for giving us this talk.